Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and thanks for listening in today to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. My guest today is not only a culinary school graduate, patient, and ended up teaching culinary arts at the high school level. But probably even more life-changing was when she went to Germany as a study abroad student and came back with a husband. And all that is just part of her culinary school story. And we hope to get to all of that in this episode. But first, I would like to give a warm welcome to our guest, Stacey Welch Andrada. Well, hi, Stacey. Welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Awesome. So we have a lot to get to today. So let's start right at the beginning. How did you start out cooking? And when did you first realize that you wanted to go to culinary school? So I first started cooking when I was seven years old with my Easy Bake Oven that I bought with my own money. (laughs) No one gave it to me. And I uh, would make creations for my dad and for my mom. And I just thoroughly loved that. I loved getting dirty with that. And then when I was 11, I started watching uh, food shows. And back then we didn't have the food network. There was the main ingredient with Bobby Flay on Lifetime. So I would watch him and I thoroughly loved it. So I decided to twist around one of his recipes and I wrote to him. I made him a little card and everything and I mailed it to New York City. A few months later, I get a phone call. And my mom answers the phone and she was in shock that the phone would be for me. So she goes over and she's like, Stacy, you have a phone call. I'm it's like, some man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's calling me. And so I speak to this person and she goes, I'm the producer of the main ingredient with Bobby Flay. And he was so impressed that an 11 year old girl twisted around one of his recipes and is so interested in cooking that he would like for you to come to New York City, see a taping of his show and go to his restaurant. Wow. And I was just like, what? This is amazing but I did not get to go because we had just moved to Florida from Michigan so they sent me a t-shirt and a car just to keep me to keep me going through cooking and everything and when I was 14 years old I got my first job at a smoothie shop where I was originally hired to stand on the side of US 1 or up here in New England they call it Route 1 uh, and stand in a banana suit in the lovely Florida weather to draw people into the smoothie shop. (laughs) My first day there, they trained me on how to make smoothies and wraps, which I was over the moon. I had so much fun. I loved it. So yes, I did wear the costume, but I also got to make food as well, which I loved. And uh, another person that had worked in the shop eventually, and I was her supervisor when I was 15, I had keys to the place and everything, uh, was a girl called Megan Fox. And she was one of the laziest people there. (laughs) What a fun story. That was (laughs) good times. The first week that she was hired, they said, she goes, I need to have two weeks off. And the boss is like, I just hired you. How is that? She goes, well, I'm going to be making a movie in the Bahamas with the Olsen twins. And he's like, well, I can't say no to that. So uh, when I was, that was 15. And then I was in high school. I uh, got into the culinary program my sophomore year because they didn't have it open to freshmen, which really stunk. But uh, I was able to get into that program and I got a job at a country club as an apprentice. So I left the smoothie shop and that was when I got to learn all about knife skills and everything right then and there. And I worked from the bottom up. I was in doing prep to helping the dishwasher to doing uh, the pantry with salads and desserts. And then my senior year, they finally put me on the hotline, which was exciting being a young girl on the hotline. And then that summer after I graduated in high school in 2004, I went to Maine with my boss and I got to 
be on the hotline and do desserts. I got to cook lobster, make lobster all the time. It was so much fun. And then um, throughout uh, high school, I was also doing culinary competitions with Skills USA. And that's where I met Chef Barber. He was one of my judges over in Nationals, which was awesome. And I was really torn about which culinary school to go to. It was either Johnson Wales or CIA. But I eventually decided Johnson Wales because I just wasn't ready to leave my family that quick to go up to New York because we were living in Florida. And I just loved everything that Johnson Wales had offered. And it was just amazing the way that you could personally talk with the chef instructors and everything. And while I was at JWU, I was able to do two internships in Germany. And yeah, it was an amazing experience. So you, you picked the Johnson & Wales uh, Miami campus because you were already living in South Florida, Central Florida? Yeah, Stewart. Yeah, it was only 100 miles away. Oh, so it was real close. Better than going to Hyde Park at the time, right? Yeah, exactly. Sure. And Chef Barber, he was a judge at this competition and an instructor at Johnson & Wales? Yep. So was he an influence maybe to get to go there? Yeah, a little bit. It was awesome to have him as an instructor, for sure. He, w he just made me laugh nonstop. He told me that the class that I was in, that was the one class that gave him all like five star reviews as an instructor. It was my class, <laughs> which as a teacher, I found out was really important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get to you being a teacher in just a minute, but <laughs> let's go back then to that first day. So you decided to go to Johnson & Wales at the Miami campus. So you're there, you're, you're, you're showing up, I guess, with suitcases, you're ready to move in, and, and what's going through your mind? Tell, tell the listeners what it's like that first day, what's, what's happening, what's the process? Well, 2004 was a very active storm season, so it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to leave my mom and dad. It was more like, we have to drop you off, we need to evacuate, there is a Category 4 storm coming to hit our home. <laughs> And we were, so, I remember I was so excited. Oh, I'm going to be staying at Tropical Point, which was going to be the brand new dorms, which were not done. So we had to stay off campus. So I left my folks rather quickly. They made sure I had enough food and everything. And then I was off campus, which this was a whole new experience for me because I had been at home and I figured I was on campus having all the luxuries of being on campus then come to find out I'm off campus and I met people I never had come in contact with before. I mean, it was a brand new experience. I mean, here I am used to being at home and going to work. And then I'm meeting people from like New Jersey and Virginia and what their life is like up there. The first time I ever heard about a, what a Wawa was. And I'm like, what are y'all talking about? And my first day when school actually started after all the storms went by and Miami didn't get anything. My hometown got hit royally good, though. Um, I, ex I expected, okay, I'm going to be in the labs because that's what every student talked about. You're in the labs. No, I had academics first. I got to... Oh. I had academics. I'm like, come on. I mean, just got done with that. So it was English and math and all that fun stuff that I had to take my first trimester. But I didn't let that hold me back I mean, within the first one or two weeks, I went to the culinary office and said, hey, how can I get involved? I want to do something. I want to get involved. I, I got to do something. And that's when I learned about the special functions team. And I remember seeing Will Glass and seeing Brian Willoughby walking around in their leadership team um, uh, gear, which yeah, that was before we were called t teaching assistants. And I'm like, I want to be like them. I want to get involved. How, what do I do? And following week, there was an open house and I helped Chef Wunninger with his open house. And that was awesome. I, and we were in HK2. I remember that for a fact. HK2. <laughs> Hot Kitchen 2. Yeah. So going back, let's talk about academics because the listeners may not know that. When you go to culinary school, you're not always cooking. I mean, at the university level, college level, you have to take those classes. What are they like? Give them a taste of what it is. Did you like them? Did you not like them? Were they beneficial? Can I maybe go into that a little bit? Yeah. So it's not you're going to cooking school. You actually do need to learn additional 
uh, learn additional math more than what you would do in high school. I mean, this is a full four year college. It is a, you're going to get a, an actual degree, not like a little certificate. It, you are going to be continuing to learn. You do need to know how to write papers. <laughs> um, so English, English was fun. I mean, because I enjoyed writing, which pans that out later in my life for my blog. And then math, math, I never enjoyed. However, when it came to food cost control with Jude Ferreira, I enjoyed that math because that actually was applicable. How many tomatoes do you need to buy? Okay, thank you. Real world terms, not geometry. Geometry means nothing to me, okay? It's more like how much sour cream do you need to get? There you go. How much does it cost per ounce? What is this? That made sense to me. The square root of something does not make sense to me. I'm sorry. It's too abstract. Exactly. That doesn't make sense to me. So um, the first year, uh, math again, and then English and science. Science is not my favorite either. And then sophomore year was food cost control, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And Jude Ferreira, he was an awesome professor. He would stay, uh, he would help students out on his lunch break in the tutoring center. And I would be there. I'm like, look, okay, I need to understand this. And he made it fun. He made it make sense. And then um, in junior and senior year, we took additional classes. So like psychology. Wow, that was really interesting. And you think, oh, well, you're going to culinary school. You don't need that. Well, when you become a boss later on or a supervisor or, hey, just another person in the kitchen, you need to understand, okay, why is that person thinking that way? Well, it could be from their background and how they were raised. So don't look back. Don't look at them as, oh, well, they're odd. No, mm -hmm. we're all different and unique. <laughs> for a reason. Um, and then sociology was amazing. I really enjoyed learning about different cultures. And then food and film was a wonderful course. I thoroughly enjoyed that course my senior year. And that, again, is an academic class. That was a fun elective for me. Um, and food writing, I love that. Also, again, with uh, food and film and food writing were two separate electives, um, both taught by Michael Moskva, which I enjoyed so much because you got to, okay, it's like you're learning about food in the kitchens and you're having your hands in it, but then you get to use that with your mind at a different level. I just loved it. Good. And so then you went into labs at some point. Yep. Thinking back, what was your best class, your best lab, and what was your worst and why? I loved everything, honestly. Okay. Okay, yeah. And my first course, my first lab class was dining room. I'm like, come on, when am I going to get into the kitchen? Uh -huh. But Chef Marcel, Dexy Marcella was a sweetheart. She, I mean, which that totally helped me for later on um, at Johnson Wales because I did bartending and serving. I helped her out on events outside of the university. So that really was helpful. Um, trying to think meat cutting i thoroughly enjoyed meat cutting as well i mean and that also i got to see how that was applied uh, when i was living in germany because i was the only girl going what can i do to get into meat cutting like in german i'm like pointing i want to get down there i don't want to be stuck in pastry i want to get down there <laughs> <laughs> this is so much fun and they're like what um trying to think i really didn't have a worse class i enjoyed something different in every class it was something unique every class was unique for its thing like bartending i'm like oh i'm not gonna like this oh hey i ended up liking that and i ended up bartending for parties down in miami so yeah that, it all applies. So don't prejudge <laughs> these classes they're there for a reason exactly you're thinking, oh, well, I just want to be a chef. Well, uh, that's what I thought. And then my senior year, I'm like, I want to get into higher education. And with having an actual four-year degree, I was able to get my master's. I mean, you never know what life is going to do. <laughs> yeah, life is funny. You all have different roads. You don't know where you're going to end up. Exactly. Is there one thing you wish you had known before you got to culinary school that, you know, you found out afterwards, you're like, ah, that would have been helpful. Or that would be helpful for listeners to know, like, this is something you should know before you go. Honestly, you could see the students that had never set foot in the kitchen versus that did. So I know laws have changed, but if you can get a couple days in while you're in school, 
young or old, whatever you're doing, set foot in an actual kitchen. I am so happy that I had my experience before Johnson & Wales because that really prepared you for what you're going to study. And you got to see, okay, what you learn in culinary school may be different than what you learn in the industry. And that is fine. And guess what? There's so many ways to skin a cat. And I don't know why that, that saying is like that, but it's true. So many chefs do so many different things differently. And guess what? It's okay to learn them all. <laughs> Did you find that high school was a benefit? Go, you know, doing the culinary in high school, does that a help or a good transition going into uh, the college level? Yes, I would say definitely, because since I did culinary competitions, I was fortunate that my school offered the culinary program, which I'm seeing up here in New England, not a lot of uh, high schools have that, which is kind of sad because, I mean, trades are there learn a trade. Um, so I was really fortunate that my high school in Florida had that and um, that they were also uh, very involved with Skills USA, which competing level versus being in a restaurant are two different things. You have to make sure your knife skills are on point and you get to get the feedback from other chefs. I mean, you have chefs that work in clubs, chefs that work in restaurants, and it's awesome to get that. Yeah, I think that like the pro start for the National Restaurant Association is really big, particularly in Florida and other states as well, and they have a lot of competitions. Now, your school was not pro start, it was a Skills USA, or did they participate in that as well? So my, um, the culinary program that I was in was pro start affiliated, but we just didn't do the pro start competitions. When I was in high school, we just did skills USA. Um, and now when I went back to teach, they don't do skills USA now, but they do pro start, which, Hey, okay. Um, and pro start is all like team based and skills USA is all individually. Good. So now you're in school, you're, did, you're going for your four-year degree at Johnson & Wales. You have belonged or participated in a lot of extracurricular committees, clubs. Tell us a little bit about that because I know you were on the special functions and that was, you know, you did a lot of outside events and you even, you even had a little reward cruise at the end there, I see. So maybe you could tell the listeners about the importance of getting involved in, in this and then some of the things that you got inv involved in and why it was valuable in your opinion. So what you put into it is what you get out of it. So for students that just go to class and leave, you're only getting that education that you paid for. If you stay to help volunteer for different events um, and open houses and different and get to know the instructors because some instructors have businesses outside of the university, that's extra education that you didn't have to pay for. And you're getting your money's worth and you're getting an awesome experience. So what the special functions team was, was a team of all student volunteers. Yes, we did not get paid. You are a volunteer. You are volunteering your time for uh, what we would have would be distinguished visiting chefs, which a visiting chef could be from an old alumni to a famous chef, which we had one chef, uh, which was uh, one of our chef instructors, Chef Wagner, his chef from Germany came over and did a special dinner. And with this, uh, you had students that were in the kitchen, only a select few, not everyone got to be in the kitchen, and that's okay. And then uh, most of the students would be in the dining room, which I know a lot of students are like, but I want to be a chef. Okay, well, you still got to learn the dining room aspect. And how to deal with people. Like you're in the kitchen, you still have to learn how to deal with people too. Um, and uh, there was the visiting chef dinners, there was the open houses, there were the career exploration weekends, which where high school students got to come in, which I was one of those students, so it was cool to volunteer for it, to see is Johnson Wales really the right choice for me? Or am I sure I want to go to the school? Or am I sure I really want to do this major? So you had those students there too. Um, and there was also uh, the trip around the world dinner where every kitchen was a country and we had students helping out chef instructors in um, the kitchen and helping them get things ready for different stations of food, which was awesome. So special functions team, yeah, was a team of students that would volunteer their time for various events throughout the university. And we also went to, I forget what they call it now, but at that time it was Miami Dolphin Stadium. And we would go there and volunteer um, 
for the home games in the concession stand. Now you may think, okay, these students are going to culinary school. Why are they going to be working in a concession stand? Well, that's another part of food service. I mean, these students could possibly go on to manage that. And so they have to see that. And, um, what we would do was that was our fundraiser for our special functions crews at the end of the school year. And that was a blast. We went to the Bahamas and my last one that we did for my senior year, well, my junior year, because I was in Germany, my senior year was we went to Mexico and that was an experience. I would, I told my mom now what had happened in Mexico, how we <laughs> rented a van not affiliated with the crews, which you should never do, <laughs> which I would never do now. And we went up to Cancun and we got to see uh, the local restaurants and what the locals did. And it was amazing. But would I do that now? No, I can't believe it. You have to be young and stupid once, right? And then there was also in the Bahamas, we had a mopeding accident. The crews and all the Johnson Wales people told us, do not rent the mopeds on the island. And guess what? We did it. But we weren't alone. We had Chef Raworth with us, right? So it was okay. Um, and then Chef Raworth and another student got hurt. And then the islander said, okay, we'll just jump in the ocean. It's fine. And Chef Raworth is like, no, how about I do that? And you, how about you do what I just did and you jump in the ocean? Oh, yeah, but it'll be very beneficial. And uh, Chef Raworth is now, um, he now lives up in uh, New Hampshire. And I ended up working for him as an adjunct when I've since I've been living up here in Massachusetts. Oh, so you kept in touch. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. You never know how your connections work. Now you mentioned Germany. Tell us about that. That was a study abroad, part of the school curriculum. You get credit for that. Tell us how you picked that country and then what happened when you were there. So my first uh, internship was for my associate's degree, and it was Chef Wagner, of course, that said, you need to go to BASF in Ludwigshaven, Germany, and work there. That'll be a great internship for you. And I'm like, okay, sure, whatever you say, we'll do it. Not giving any thought. Uh, one thing I wish I did was research about Germany and try to learn uh, a little bit about the language and what they do. Instead of just going in, going, hey, whatever, I'm here. I just learned while I was there what life was like. Like everything is closed on Sundays versus here in the U.S. Everything is open 24-7, sure. mostly. And um, saying hello, saying goodbye. Um, what they eat for breakfast can be significantly different than what to, we eat. Like the pancakes, the bacon, and the eggs. I mean, sometimes you have the eggs, but it was meat and cheese and bread, which... I loved that was, I lived off that. Um, and BASF is uh, the world's largest chemical company. Now people may think, well, why are you going there for a culinary internship? Well, the place that we were at is where we fed their executives and directors and we did feed the outside public. It was a restaurant, which was an amazing experience. And while I was there, they uh, told us, uh, they told me, if you are interested after you're finished with your degree, we would love to hire you. And uh, when you're done, I said, okay, sure. That sounds great. I would love to do that. And then um, while we were there, we had a different, a few events, which one of them was Alphonse Schubeck. And he is a Michelin star chef uh, in Bavaria. So um, we watch, my husband and I watch German TV still, and we'll see, Alphonse Schubeck, and I just immediately think of my internship wow. right away from Johnson & Wales. And then for my last internship for my, for my bachelor's degree, I didn't know what I was going to do. I honestly, I had lived and breathed the university. I was doing culinary related events. I loved it. So another internship, I'm like, okay, I don't know where I should go. And then that's when Chef Wagner said, you should go to View Zinzig. And I'm like, I'm assuming that's in Germany. I have never <laughs> heard of this place. And he said, yeah, you should go here. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll do it. You told me about ASF. Why not? And this internship I did not get paid at. So I had to make sure I had plenty of money saved. Um, but they did have room and board for us. So basically we were working for that. And that was an experience because the chef is French and he now lives in Germany. So he knows not to waste anything. 
like freezing vegetable scraps for the stock, using every part of the animal, making pate. I mean, I hadn't seen, I mean, I did pate a few times in school, but to actually see a restaurant continue to make it, most of the time they buy it. So that was a really awesome experience. Um, and then my trip over there was uh, one thing. <laughs> There was a lot of storms happening in Europe, and this is the one time I did not pack any extra clothes, and of course, the airlines lost my luggage, and the trains were all a mess. I was supposed to arrive there at 10 a.m. I ended up getting there by 9 p.m. that day. It was crazy, and I remember when I walked into the kitchen, I see this guy just looking at me, and I'm like, okay, I am exhausted. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where I'm at. I'm in this little village. It's literally a little village. <laughs> We're near the city. <laughs> and he just stopped and was looking at me. And I'm like, oh, hey, okay. And they're all like talking to me in German. I'm like, oh, crud. I wish I remembered my German <laughs> from two years ago. And I'm like, okay, it'll all come back. It'll all come back. Because they didn't speak that much English. It was either that or French. And I'm like, I don't know French. I know kitchen French, but that doesn't help right now. And I remember the chef yelling at this guy saying, get back to work. And I'm like, okay, that I understood. And after they showed me around in this restaurant, it's like, okay, this will be a fun internship, especially when it's, I get my clothes and my knives, I'll be really happy. And that the, the next day they had me come down in my cowboy boots and jeans and say, hey, you can prep, right? Like, sure, why not? And I was trying to talk to this guy that was living upstairs because we all had different rooms and we shared the kitchen and the bathroom, the common areas. And I'm like, yeah, so I'm from Florida, just trying to talk to him. I'm like, yeah, so I'm from Florida. I'm here on an internship and I have a huge school project that I have to get ready to do. He just says, huh better you than me. And he leaves. I'm like, well, this is going to be a fun three months. I'm trying to get to know people here and just talk. And this guy, we ended up talking more. Um, my first uh, position in this restaurant was I was over in, uh, sorry, I'm thinking it in German, was in a pastry and in garmage for salads. And we would talk and we would drink beer and play cards to relax after work because you were there from, you had to get down there by like 8 a.m and work and prep and have lunch service. And then there was about an hour break. We also had coffee and cake time, which was nice. But you had like about an hour to two hour break. And then you had to go back downstairs for dinner. So it was an all day thing. Wow. And no money. And no money. Exactly. <laughs> and no money. And so this guy, I'm, I'm slowly warming him up to like talk and all that. And towards the end, we're joking around. He took us out. We went to McDonald's over there. And then he's like, oh, a friend of mine is a bouncer. He has his own business. You want to go to a club? I'm like, sure. Why not? So I'm like seeing the town. Like we went to Bonn and I'm learning more about Bonn. And that was the capital of Germany when Germany was divided. So that was pretty cool. So like, yeah, Hey, there's something outside of Zinzig. This is pretty cool. All right. Um, and then we went to the Cologne as well to see the cathedral. So that was fun. And then, yeah, halfway th while I'm on my internship, uh, I'm starting to get to know this guy. His name is Victor and we're talking more and then they, and then we ended up dating. But we kept it very hush hush. Yeah. I mean, because we still have. You kept it hush hush though. You didn't want people to know that you worked with. Yeah. I mean, we were also trying to keep things professional. So when they eventually did find out, but it was more like, okay, yes, chef. Okay, there you go. Yes, Victor, whatever you need, fine. And we kept it very professional. Um, and then they said, oh, Stacy's going to get rotated to Victor Station, which I was all excited for because finally I get to cook. All right. I get to be on entremetier. We get to do all the side dishes for the proteins. All right. So the there was another intern with Victor there. Uh, and But this guy, he, you could see he's not into cooking at all. So just when I get rotated to Victor Station, I'm asking him, okay, this protein, what are these two side dishes? And I was making it a game so I could remember what goes with what. So when they would say the dish, I would automatically get things ready for it. And they're all like, wow you're better than this guy. I'm like, well, thanks. I'm just trying to do my job. <laughs> so I know what's going on. And then uh, they just saw like how Victor and I would work well together. We would be bouncing things off one another. I'd get things ready. And we're all like, oh, they thought it would be really explosive. Oh, you guys are working together like next to each other. And 
we didn't let that bother us. And then while I was there, I was trying, I was getting back in contact with BASF and I was able to get things together with Chef Wagner's help for me to eventually move over there for a year and which was awesome. And then you moved back and you were, it, it, you obviously got married and have a family now. Yeah. So I tried to stay longer in Germany, but the economy had hit hard in 2008 to 2009 in Europe, like how it had hit hard over here. So I told him, look, I won't be able to stay. And he goes, well, I'll come with you. So like, are you sure? I mean, all your family and friends are here. He goes, well, I never see them because I'm busy working and I want to be with you. I'm like, okay, that works. So I had to come back and, um, in January of 2010, he moved over. I was working at the Breakers in Palm Beach. So I was living in my house that I grew up in because, again, the economy had hit hard. I was happy I got to pay back my student loans. Not many people could do that at that time. So I moved back and my parents had moved out to take care of my grandmother. So we had the house to ourselves, and uh, which was great. We got married and Victor, uh, yeah, we got married two times. We got married in January so we could get started on all the paperwork for the green card, which I had only heard about. But then to actually do it yourself is like this thick of paperwork to do. Mm. Crazy. And there's also cost added to that. It was cl close to $2,000, which no one tells you of how expensive it is to do all the correct processes for this. So we did it. And in March, we had our wedding that we actually planned. So I got to actually wear my wedding dress. I didn't work the night before like I did before in January, <laughs> which all the guys in the kitchen were all like, don't do it. I'm like, really? Thanks for the support. Um, and then in, it was in July that he officially got all of his green guard paperwork and he could finally look for work. And he ended up working up in Vero beach at John's Island, which is a very private country club. They have close to 3000 members though, which is amazing. And then we had, we, we, we then were starting to have a family. That time I was the executive sous chef at the country club that I was an apprentice at. And I was working very closely with the my old high school and having apprentices come over and work with them. And one of the apprentices is Dallas Wynn, wow. who has done very well. She's kicking butt in Miami. I'm so proud of her. She's I knew she would do amazing things. She was just a hard worker. Um, at a young age and had such a passion for food and now she's doing awesome as an executive pastry chef so I was really happy I got to do that and then when we started having a family I ended up teaching at my old high school for a few years how was that now coming from a student when you were in school now to being the teacher seeing it on the other side what was that like for you so I mean, by that time, my, I had come out of my shell. In high school, I was very shy with everything. And in the kitchen, I was totally different. I was outgoing. But in high school, I was just very to myself. I didn't get involved with all the drama of high school and all that fun stuff. So when I see my students that are all like going through all the fun dramas of high school, they're like, well, chef, you must have been popular. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> No, I hung out with the drama kids because they had so much life and I was just more involved in culinary. Really? You were involved in culinary? I'm like, yeah, I knew at that age that I wanted to do that. Wow. And then seeing them all like stressed out about testing. Oh my goodness. I was so thankful that my I was able to squeeze in. Like I didn't have to pass the FCAT in order to graduate high school. But now seeing these students doing, they are forced into doing like AP classes, even though they don't want to. Um, and then taking AP tests and then all the other standardized testing. It's like three months of testing. And I see these poor kids, they're like just fried out. I'm like, I am so happy and thankful I didn't have to do that. So when I did- Why do they get forced into the testing? Yeah. Uh, which I got to find out when I was doing higher education administration that, I mean, you have like Pearson and all these other testing companies make deals with states saying, hey, if we will pay you this much if we can test your students. And so they do it, right? And I mean, it just stinks because they're, I mean, you have students that are not good test takers or they would rather be in average classes, which I was in average classes. Hey, it's okay to be an average kid. But I mean, again, 
AP testing through Pearson and everything else. It, it's just crazy to see that. Now that with that is that knowledge that you know is that why you homeschool your children or is that part of it? That's one of the reasons. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. Um, another reason is where we live at in our city. Um, there's a lot of crime at times, and they just mix all the kids into one thing. And I want to prepare my kids for their, their future. Um, I want to be the ones to have the effect on their hearts and not the world because the world is ever changing. So I want to be, I want to be able to instill that into them at an early age. Plus we're also on my husband's work schedule, which at first he was like, Oh, I don't know about homeschooling. I don't know about that because in Germany, it's not allowed. Oh, You're not allowed to do that. So when he was looking at that, he goes, well, do you think you could, could handle it? I'm like, I taught high school for three years. I think <laughs> I can handle this. <laughs> I can handle my own two daughters. <laughs> I can handle my own two kids. And so with this, we're on my husband's work schedule because chef life and family life just don't mix. As you know, I mean, you're always working. So that's why we start in the summer when he is the most busy. And when he has more times off in the winter, because we have snow up here, which is nice. I know my neighbors are like, snow, no. Um, we'll have more time off. And so if he has a free weekend in the summer, if and when that happens, we'll go camping and we can just stop what we're doing. And there you go. And in September, of course, I always come down to Florida as much as I can. And I'm usually there in September, prime hurricane season time. Um, so the kids get to learn about that as well. Now, how does um, Isabella and Gabriella feel about having mom as their teacher? They they love it. I ask them because I've asked them that. Mm -hmm. I do. I mean, Isabel is now where she is now in third grade. I am, I'm going to be a mom of an eight year old. When did that happen? Like, wow, life. Is, wow. So I asked them, they love it. I mean, Isabel used to be, uh, of course, she doesn't remember. She was in preschool while I was teaching in high school. And uh, they always say, oh, I want to ride the school bus. So we want, we would march with our church over in Salem, New Hampshire, and they finally get to ride the school bus. They're like, Mama, it's so cramped. I'm like, yep, this is a school bus. You want to ride it? But there's like three people on the seat. And I'm like, yep, and that's how it is. <laughs> well, this is no fun. I'm like, well, you get to ride your school bus. End of story. <laughs> Check that box. <laughs> Done. <laughs> So Victor is now an executive chef up there in New England at a country club. So he, he was trained and went, probably went through an apprentice program. Who's the better cook, you or him? He doesn't cook that much when he's at home. So we'll leave it at that, honestly. I mean, he has learned, like, <laughs> when we were first married and I would make him dinner, he was like, oh, it just needs a little bit of this. Okay, when we were first married. And I'm like, no. okay, I am your wife now. You please be thankful for what you have. Like, come on. But there are honestly, sometimes I'm like, okay, honestly, what did you think? What do you, what do you think this means? And he'll be honest with me, which is how we grow with one another with that. Because he'll ask me for ideas as far as lunch ideas or dinner ideas for the club, which is fun because he knows I enjoy that. And now that I have my cookie business, I'll be like, here, taste this. What do you think it needs? How's the consistency? How's the flavor? And we bounce things back off one another. But honestly, yeah, there are days and he can see it in my face if I just go, how was dinner? It's good. Great. I'm wiped out. It was a long day with the girls. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about your business, you do have a business now, which works because you're the teacher, the homeschool and, and mom, and it wor works with your lifestyle too, but you're really trying to be that, bring out that entrepreneurship. Tell us about Sprinkles with Stacy <laughs> and, and how did that come about and, and how the, the listeners can check it out if they want. So I uh, started my blog about five years ago when I was, for, when I was home with um, Gabriella and I was just documenting stories and blogging is a totally different ball game. I wish I learned about that, which I'm so happy Johnson Wills offers that because stuff about domains and transfer, it's a totally different language coding, right? I, yeah, I, I did destroy my site one time and it went white and I'm like, Oh my gosh, what did I do? This is totally different. So I just re I, uh, what was it? Two years ago, I changed it from to a new domain and uh, to Sprinkles by Stacy, and it had more because Victor goes to me. He goes, "You do realize you have more baking recipes on your blog than you do savory." 
Like, well, yeah, because savory, you can just throw things together and there you go. I mean, and that's it. And baking, it needs to be a kind of a strict recipe because if you mess it up, I, yeah, it's a formula. There you go. And he goes, you do realize that? Like, no, I didn't realize that. And so he left it at that. And then in March, I took a cookie decorating class which, I mean, is the biggest thing right now with these sugar cookies, and they look like pieces of artwork. It's amazing. I'm like, wow, look at the attention to detail. And so in March, I had um, one of my MOPS moms, which MOPS is short for Mothers of Preschoolers. When I am not blogging or baking or homeschooling, <laughs> being a mom and all that, I am a MOPS volunteer which overlooks uh, the groups in New England, all these mo moms groups, which is an amazing ministry. And I love it. I absolutely love it. So she came to our group and she gave us a class. And this mom, seeing her, a mom of three children, now has her own business after she just took a cookie class. I was like, wow, look at her go. I follow her on Instagram and it's just amazing. And she has no culinary background either. And I'm like, wow. look at this. She is gifted. This is beautiful. And so I took a class. She gave this class to us before the virus broke out. So that was our last meeting was a cookie class. And I'm like, I am loving this. I am loving this. This is art. And so I decided to uh, take some more classes during quarantine because there was nothing else to do while you're at home, right? Everyone's baking sourdough bread. And I'm like, yeah, well, let's work on sugar cookies. Okay. End of story. Done. And I just go to Victor. I'm like, you know what? I am really loving this. He goes, yeah, you're baking cookies every day. I'm like, <laughs> so what do you think if I could bake these cookies and actually sell them? <laughs> because I keep on baking them. And he goes, as long as you can handle it. I'm like, I can handle it. He goes, I don't want you to get too crazy because this could blow up. I'm like, no, I will learn to say no. And I've had to. And so I had, I looked it up all up online and I had the Haverhill uh, health inspector come in, check out my house. And he's like, as far as I'm concerned, you're in business. Done. That was easy. That, it was that easy. So I ordered business cards. And thanks to my blog, I already had my logo. I already had my website. So I just added the area for the baking part. And there you go. Wow. So what is the website? It's called sprinklesbystacy.com. And I have a little section for shop. Um, I cannot ship across state lines. That is one of the rules within cottage food laws because I am making it from my house. But I am able to get away with that a little bit by um, hand delivering things because I know a lot of people in New Hampshire because that's where we go to church. So I'm able to do that. But I cannot ship across state. Now, do you, do you sell it like a farmer's market or any retail thing? Yeah, that I can do. But uh, again, I don't want to get it too big because, yeah, Victor's <laughs> like, you know, we're just saying no. So it's more like I post things on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, and then that friend goes, hey, can I order these from you? So I just uh, finished up yesterday. I made sunshine cookies for a friend of mine who is a teacher. She wanted to give cookies to her students. And she goes, feel free to add your business card to every single one of those sunshine cookies for the parents. I'm like advertising for me. Thanks, Gary. All right. <laughs> so at least they could go on to uh, sprinkleswithstacy.com and see some of your work, right? They could see some of the, the photos and. Yes, yeah, sprinkles by Stacy. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'll put that in the show notes because if anybody wants to see it, <laughs> make sure it's there. Um, <laughs> Uh, sprinklesbystacy.com and I'm also on Instagram. I also have my Facebook page. I do have Twitter, but I never use it. Honestly, I, I have it, but it's there. Um, but it's mostly Instagram and Facebook. I have one for my business and then I have, um, an Instagram for my personal life, which is open because, uh, I homeschool and that's how I connect with other homeschooling families. Um, and then of course I'll throw out some of the cookie stuff out on that page just to like show other homeschoolers schooling moms like hey if you need anything i'm here tell us about mops how could someone find out about that if they were interested oh mops mops is amazing so i was uh what right after i had isabel in 2012 i was uh invited to go to a mops meeting and i figured i don't need that this is just another mom's meeting what are they going to talk about diapers and that's it but my first meeting there it was all about motherhood and faith 
because it, because at that time I was going through a hard time because I was encouraged so much in culinary school saying, you're going to go so far. You're going to do this. You're going to be like Michelle Bernstein. You're going to be like this. And now I'm at home mm-hmm. and I'm married and I'm at home with my kids. Am I really doing everything that I was encouraged to do? And I mean, there are times that I have felt that way. Am I doing everything that I was encouraged so much? It's like, is being at home as a mom enough? And that first conversation I had at a mops meeting, I'm like, I'm raising the next generation. I'm raising another human being that is going to have an effect on this planet and how they react with other people. Are they going to react with anger or are they going to react with others with love like Jesus did? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I am doing something important. It's not about me anymore. It's not about my purpose. It's not about what I have done. It's whose life am I going to change? It's not my purpose. It's his purpose through me more. Um, And so what MOPS is, it is a Christian organization, but it is not a Bible study. It is meant for moms for all walks of life. And so I have met moms that have had drug abuse, physical abuse, stuff I had never encountered before. And it's honestly just showing them love. And that should be the main thing with everything. I mean, you see what's going on in the world today. It should be all about love. Mm. There was no war, just love, no condemnation. And so what MOPS is, it's short for Mothers of Preschoolers. And it's based in Denver, Colorado. And we also have uh, MOPS and Moms Next, which, okay, you think, okay, the lack of sleep and the, talk, the slight talking back with a three or four year old. Wait till they're in elementary school. Oh my goodness. I'm like, where did this tood come from? And yes, we homeschool, but hey, she is a kid. We do have our time out in the world. We go to dance class and things that she picks up, but it's like, God, give me grace. How am I going to react to this? I need to do something before I say something stupid and have an ultimate effect on her life. (laughs) So MOPS is all about moms coming together. And we have uh, childcare workers who at our church that are volunteers. They volunteer every other Wednesday uh, from September to May, which goodness knows with everything going on, we'll see how this pans out. And the moms get to have two hours of conversation uninterrupted. It's great. Two hours uninterrupted where we connect with one another. And it doesn't matter what our background or past is like. It's all about the here and now. And while uh, while we get to talk, we'll have conversations and crafts and things like that, all based about uh, based around a theme. And every year we have a theme. So this new theme that MOPS International is having is called Decide to Rise, arising as a mother, protecting her kids. Perfect timing around a crazy pandemic and every el- every other crazy thing that is happening in our country and around the world because MOPS is a global organization. It is in 67 countries. Uh, some countries I cannot say where because of the security threats of everything, which is amazing where this organization is at. And what I do now is I'm not only a co-coordinator of our group, trying to get things together for meetings and what are we going to do, making sure we have childcare workers and food. Food is always important, right? Uh, And coffee. Coffee is vital. What I do as a community coach is I oversee other ministry coaches in the area. What we do is making sure our groups have all the information from Mops International, reaching out to them saying, hey, how are you guys doing through all this craziness? Are you guys still meeting? And there are groups, believe it or not, no pandemic is going to hold back any mamas from getting together. They're meeting virtually. They'll meet in a Target parking lot. They'll do little scavenger hunts, anything to get together. Because even more now, we need to have a community, which I think is awesome with this podcast is you're forming a community. People need that. So if, if someone wanted to find out, is there a website or is this, how do they know if there's one local? How, how would they know that? So you can go to mops, mops.org, M-O-P-S.org. And there is an area where you, can, where you can hit find a group and you just type in your zip code and you can see what MOPS groups are near you. Um, 
oh, that's exactly what I did when I moved up here because I didn't know anyone in New England. We came up here on an adventure and because my husband, after he was let go from his job, he goes, well, I really liked Boston. I really like Boston. Why don't we move up there? My sister lived in Lowell. She moved there for a guy who ended up breaking her heart, but now she's happily married and hey, life is good now. Um, and I just didn't know anyone else. What are, how are we going to connect? So I found a MOPS group near us and now I'm co-coordinating it. And that is also now my home church, which is amazing. Perfect. So what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career in this industry or that wanted to go to culinary school? What would you tell them? Never burn your bridges and always be like a sponge absorbing new information. And there was another thing that I kind of created, another saying that I kind of created while I was there because I got to see it with students. Uh, laziness is like a disease. It's easily caught and hot, hard to get rid of. Please don't be like that. You got to be on fire. I don't care how tired you are. I mean, I can honestly say I remember like the lack of sleep. I remember just keep on going and keep on going because that time is short. I mean, can you believe that? That's already been, what, 12 years that I graduated? It's nuts. It goes by so fast. Be like a sponge. Absorb it, the information. And you never know who you meet in culinary school, how they're going to affect you in a way and where you will meet them. I never thought I would meet again Chef Ratworth and end up being an adjunct for him for a couple years. And I didn't plan on that. Um, and the friends that I had made in culinary school, I'm, I'm still friends with now. High school, not so much. Forget that. No. So always keep learning. Um, and I remember Chef Nograd would, had a little saying about that. Always keep learning. Have an open mind for sure, because there's so many well, back in my restaurant, we did it like this. Okay, you know what? There's so many other ways to do something. Don't think with that mentality. Um, yeah, always keep learning and never burn your bridges. <laughs> Great. Well, as we come to the end of our chat today and before we wrap up, thinking back now that you have this perspective, was culinary school worth it? Thinking about all the time, the money, everything that you went through and the challenges. Would you do it all again? Would you change anything? I would not change a thing. Yes, I'm still paying back those loans, kids. Yes, I am. Still, will. I don't know how long till that is just how things are set up here. And there you go. And you knew that full well when you signed the dotted line. Um, I would totally do it again. I know that I'm in a different area of the industry. I have my master's in higher education administration, but with, without having my actual four-year degree, I wouldn't be able to pursue other things. And I'm still active in it. And the memories and the experiences that I had from Jay Wu, they still live on. And yes, to this day, blue and gold still runs through my veins. And I'm not talking about my high school. I'm talking about Jay Wu. I still tell people all about Jay Wu. And yeah, I'm, I'm not that far from Providence, but I still haven't been there yet. <laughs> you have to go visit. <laughs> Alumni day. Yes. <laughs> cool. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. And I want to first thank you, Stacey, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. We really appreciate your insight and your honesty and, and the time that you spent with us. Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast. It was awesome reconnecting with you. That no, was good to see you and uh, all the best and take care. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you. And that is to share the podcast with everyone you know. And to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next culinary school story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network. Care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.